Well, hey, community, how are you guys doing today? <clears throat> you doing well? <laughs> Hope you're doing good. <clears throat> Wanna welcome everyone in the room today. Wanna welcome those of you that are watching online and you know the drill. Let's welcome our Pompano Beach campus. We <clears throat> love you guys and some good things are coming your way. I mean, Pompano, you're seeing the renovation really take shape. I mean, paint on the walls and carpets going down and we're getting real close, so excited about that. So. Well, tonight is the Super Bowl, and last week I said that I was going to make a prediction of the winner of the Super Bowl based on the Bible. Now, I've been doing this for 15 years now, and I look at the Word of God, and I try to discern, based upon Scripture, which team will be the winner of the Super Bowl. Now, this year, the two teams that are playing are the Philadelphia Eagles and the Kansas City Chiefs. So I want you guys to give a shout-out to your favorite team, the team that you're pulling for, you're rooting for. So how many of you are pulling for the Philadelphia Eagles? Let's hear it. Okay, respectable group there. How many of you are pulling for the Kansas City Chiefs? Yeah. Way fewer for the Chiefs than for the Eagles, I could tell. Just really good at, you know, discerning that kind. How many of you don't really care? I mean, you just don't care. Yeah. We're the most apathetic church when it comes to the Super Bowl. How many of you care more about the commercials and the food tonight, you know? That's what I'm talking about right there. So anyway, but I've been doing these predictions, and so without any further delay, the prediction for the winner of this year's Super Bowl, based on the Bible, is... Wow. What? Well, how did that get up there? When the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Who put that up there? I did. Who, who did that? That's not right, I know. Who did that? That's not this year's. I mean, if you can see, it says 2-2-20. Two, two, That's from three years ago. That's when the Chiefs played against the San Francisco 49ers. I predict the Chiefs would win based on the Bible, and the Chiefs did win. But that is so three years ago. That is so pre-COVID. So let's get rid of that slide. And let me make a prediction. This year, I searched the Bible. And in the Bible, the city of Philadelphia actually does appear, not making that up, two times. The book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 11, and chapter 3, verse 7. And I came across these verses. Bring up the slide. It says, write this letter to the leader of the church in Philadelphia. They attack like eagles, swooping down to feed. <laughs> Friends, these scriptures clearly, clearly, clearly predict that the Philadelphia Eagles will swoop down and descend on their prey, the Kansas City Chiefs, and will defeat them. And the Philadelphia Eagles will win this year's Super Bowl based on the Bible. Now, now don't shoot me. I'm just the messenger. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It's not necessarily that I'm rooting for the Eagles. I mean, I am. But it's not necessarily what I'm saying that way. Now, whenever I do this foolishness, I am always required by our attorney to read this disclaimer. <clears throat> it's here. Absolutely, do not place any bets on this scriptural prediction as Pastor Scott is wrong way more often than he is right. That's hurtful. It's truthful, but it's hurtful on these annual predictions. That's so, so unnecessary. Now, I posted this on social media on Friday, mostly so I could see the responses, and there's some great ones. But one of my favorites was a, a fellow pastor who, uh, who made this comment that because of my mashing up scripture and doing like this, he said, Scott's sermon this Sunday, as I'm ready to get into the sermon, Scott's sermon this Sunday, and this is Pastor Mark Gaeta, he said, will be about Jonah, the shepherd boy, and his ark of many colors. So... <laughs> That's pretty awesome there. <laughs> he mashes up four stories in about 12 words there. I mean, and if you don't get that, you need to read the Bible more. How you just do. <laughs> just get the story on the way out and start reading the Bible. So, okay, that's enough of that foolishness. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 today. It is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I come back to Luke 15 again and again and again. It's a defining chapter for us. It's kind of a definitive chapter for us as a church. It really talks about the heart and the soul of this church, Luke chapter 15. We are a Luke chapter 15 church. We just are. As the chapter begins, Jesus is teaching, and around him are a group of people who are listening to him who teach that we might, you know, we might call these people that are listening to him people of questionable character. Luke, Luke chapter 15, verse 1. 
Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. That's what Luke is saying. Now, tax collectors in that day, they were incredibly dishonest. They were hated by everybody. They were Jewish people who sold out their Jewish their Jewish friends and their Jewish uh, 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 families even and uh, in order to collect taxes for the Romans. They were hated by everybody. They were dishonest. But it says other notorious sinners, not your average run-of-the-mill sinners. These were notorious sinners that were just drawn to Jesus and his teaching. Verse two, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such despicable people. That's what the Pharisees called them. Even eating with them. And off to the side, Jesus is teaching, but off to the side is this holy huddle of these self-righteous, smug Pharisees that are kind of pointing their bony, self-righteous fingers. Look at Jesus. Look at what he's doing. He's associating with these, with these, these sinful people. How dare he do that? And it looks like he even likes them. And this wasn't the first time this happened. This happened before, and when it did, this is what Jesus said. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call sinners, not those who think that they're already good enough. They couldn't still figure out why Jesus would hang out with them. And so what Jesus does is he tells three quick stories, three stories in just rapid succession, just rapid fire about why he is hanging out with these people, these irreligious people, these people who are far from God, why Jesus is hanging out with them. And the first story is the story of the lost sheep. He tells about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one of his sheep. So Jesus used this illustration. If you had 100 sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the 99 others to go and search for the lost one until you found it? Now, this is going to sound crazy to some of you. It's not going to sound crazy to many of you because if you have a dog or a cat or a pig or a snake, or an iguana. No, okay, forget the snake and the iguana. But if you have a dog or cat, or maybe, then you know what it's like. You love your pet. And in that day, a shepherd, he cared individually about each of the sheep. And it wasn't like, okay, I got 99, one I'm left, no big deal, just a little bit of a loss, 1%, no big deal. No, Fluffy's gone. Where's Fluffy? I'm going on a rescue mission because the shepherd was attached to each of the sheep, cared individually about each of the sheep, and would go on a rescue mission for one lost sheep. We sang a song here. We're going to sing it at the end of the service and the end of the message today, Reckless Love. Such a great one. It's based on this verse of scripture. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down. It fights till I'm found. It leaves the 99, the reckless love of God. Because each of us matter. It's the one that God will go and search and rescue. And when the shepherd finds it, Jesus says in verse five, and when then you would joyfully carry it home on your shoulders. When you arrived, you would call together your friends and neighbors to rejoice with you because your lost sheep was found. That's story number one. Then he quickly tells story number two, real quick story. The woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one of them. It's the story of, well, it's a story of the lost coin. She loses one of her 10 coins. And now these coins may have represented her entire estate. So she may have lost one tenth of her entire estate. And if you have your retirement in the market, you know exactly how this woman felt when she lost one tenth or more of her entire estate. Luke 15, verse 8, it says, suppose a woman has 10 valuable silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and look in every corner of the house and sweep every nook and cranny until she finds it? Now, what would you do? Probably the same thing. That's what I would do if I lost something of value of like that. I mean, she lights a lamp, she sweeps, she dismantles the house. She's searching diligently to find that lost coin. And in verse 9, and when she finds it, she'll call on her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her because she's found her lost coin. And then Jesus tells a third story. This is the most famous story of all. One of the most famous stories in the world. It's a story of a father who loses his son. It's the lost son. It's also known as the parable of the prodigal son. 
Verse 11, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. Now, <laughs> there's some tension that's going on between the father and one of the sons. There's no question about that. I heard about a teenager who said, hey, dad, I'm going to the party. And the dad said, well, have a good time. He said, look, dad, you don't tell me what to do. Evidently, there's a little bit of tension going on there. And some of you might, that might be a flashback for you. Verse two, the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now <laughs> instead of waiting until you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now, I gotta tell you, that's a pretty gutsy request. <laughs> Dad, I, you know, I kind of want my inheritance and I don't wanna wait till you're dead. So I, could I have it now? Pastor Wayne Smith used to say, where there's a will, there's a relative. I mean, there is. And some of you know the truth of that. I mean, you just know that to be true. There's a little five-year-old went to his grandfather and said, Grandpa, can you make the sound of a frog? And his grandfather said, what do you mean? Where did you hear that I could make the sound of a frog? He said, Mommy said, I heard her tell Daddy that we're all going to be rich when you croak. <laughs> and that's just not right, being a pop-pop myself. True story. This is about three years ago. Jeremiah, our oldest grandson, is turning eight in May. I don't know, it was three or four years ago. It's a family vacation. His uncle Chris was there, and Chris evidently had told Jeremiah to come to me, and Jeremiah said, Pop Hop, can you make the sound of a frog? <laughs> Jeremiah did not know what was going on. I just looked at Chris, and I said, you are out of the will, young man. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's no relative in our family. There's just not. It's just not going to happen, so... So in this story, Jesus told the younger son he, who wants his inheritance up front, he says a few days later, this younger son, he packed all of his belongings and took a trip to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money on wild living. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to kind of see what's going on here. I mean, this son, he heads for the neon lights of the lost Baghdad Strip. I mean, a few years ago, an archaeologist discovered a, uh, an ancient scroll that reads, what happens in Baghdad stays in Baghdad. And so there, there's that. It was this wild, sensual spree, and the father's heart just breaks because he knows what's in store for his son. He's just going to get chewed up and spit out by the life that he's chasing, and he's just going to be destroyed by his own sin, by his own choices, and many parents identify with this story. Any of us identify with this story? I, I do. Then one day, when his son loses his integrity, and then when he loses his money, and when his money's gone, his friends are gone. The Bible says he finally came to his senses, verse 17. And he came to his senses on a pig farm, and he heads home, and his father's out scanning the horizon. And this next verse is one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Luke chapter 15, verse 20. It says, but while he was still a long way off, <clears throat> his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son he threw his arms around him and he kissed him now it was a few years ago that I did an, a five week series just on the parable of the prodigal son so there's so much that I could say about this but I will say this this is the only place in scripture where God is ever pictured as running it's when God ran and again, this is a story that Jesus is telling. It didn't actually happen. Jesus is telling this story. He's telling us this story about himself. That when he sees a child who's been far off from him, he will run to them and wrap his arms around them and then welcome them home. And friends, in that day, old men did not run. It was disrespectful. And Jesus is picturing this father who runs to his son unheard of. And the listeners are hearing this and they're showing they just can't believe what they're hearing in this story. But Jesus wanted to be clear. This lost child, this lost son matters deeply. And then he welcomes him home. Verse 23, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And friends, with three quick stories, he was trying to explain to these religious leaders why. Why he would spend time with people of questionable character. Why he was hanging out with these non-believing, irreligious, yes, sinful people. And with these three stories, Jesus was also communicating three truths. Three truths that are very important. These are three truths that drive us as a church. We are a Luke 15 church. These are three truths that drive us. And the first one is that something valuable is lost. 
Just as the sheep was valuable to the shepherd, the coin was valuable to the woman, and the son was valuable to the father. And Jesus wanted to communicate to these religious leaders, these people that I'm hanging out with, they're valuable. They matter. They matter to God. Every person matters. That's why Jesus one time he struck up with a conversation with a woman at a well who'd been married five times. And she was living with a guy who wasn't her husband. And he went out of his way to talk to her to have this conversation. All the other men in her life looked at her like they wanted to get something from her. Jesus looked at her because he wanted to give her something. John 4.10, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who I am, you would ask me and I would give you. I would give you living water. This is why Jesus had a conversation one night, halfway through the night with a wealthy, spiritually seeking man by the name of Nicodemus who hadn't been able to find his self-worth through his net worth. This is why one of the last things that Jesus did before dying on a cross is he turned to a thief who was next to him who didn't matter to anybody. He said, today, today you will be with me in paradise because people matter. Something valuable is lost. Here's an important truth that drives us. Every human being is valuable to God. Every single one. You matter to God. You may not think that you matter to people in your neighborhood or you matter to people at work or maybe you don't even think you matter really to people in your family. You matter to God. You matter to God. Truth number one. Second truth Jesus wanted to communicate from these stories. It grows out of the first Because something valuable is lost, we must aggressively search for it. The shepherd, he kept searching for that lost sheep. The woman lit a lamp and she swept the house. She dismantled the house. She turned up the house inside out, upside down. And the father, well, he was kind of in a tough spot. (laughs) The father couldn't go searching for his son because his son was rebelling from the father. That wouldn't do any good. So what does the father do? He just creates an environment, an environment of home, an environment that is, that is so warm, that is so inviting, that is so compelling, that is so magnetic, that the son would know that when he goes home that there's no embarrassment, there's no shame, there's no judgment, there's just love, there's just love. And that's what the father does, and that's why the son came home. Now the third truth that Jesus wanted to communicate is that when the lost is found, there is always rejoicing. There is much rejoicing when the lost is found. The shepherd Rejoiced. The woman rejoiced. The father who, threw a, who lost his son threw a party and rejoiced when his son was found. And have you ever lost something? I mean, you lost it for a while. I mean, yeah, we did a little hand raise. I would have two hands and my feet. And I mean, I've lost things before. And, and the longer something is lost or the more valuable something is that's lost, the greater the rejoicing. And we all, all know what it's like, you know, when you... When you misplace your keys and you need to go somewhere (laughs) and you start looking for them and you frantically are searching for them and you start blaming the other people in the house. And even if there's nobody in the house, you still blame somebody because it couldn't have possibly been you. And, And so, and then when you find it, there is much rejoicing. When you find something that has been lost, it's celebration time. And in the middle of these parables, Jesus kind of takes a little pause. He tells the first one, kind of interesting. The the second one, the lost coin, not as compelling, not as engaging. He says, okay, I'm gearing up for the big story. It's the lost son. But before he does, he takes a step out of the imagery. He takes a step out of the parables. And then he makes this statement, which is a statement of fact. It's not imagery now. It's just a statement of fact. It's Luke 15, 10. It's before the parable of the lost son. He says, and in the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Isn't that great news? That is great, great news. For years as a pastor, I used to say that the angels celebrate in heaven. And, you know, I think that probably happens, but that's not what that says. As a matter of fact, I've, I've got a Christian musician friend. He stayed at our house. This is pre-Fort Lauderdale. This is when we're back in Clearwater. A long time ago, Larry Bryant wrote a song. That's when the angels rejoice, when one person comes to the Father. It's a great, catchy tune. It was like really hit the charts way back in the day. And, and I think it's accurate because I think the angels rejoice. But that's not what this verse says. It says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. And who's in the presence of the angels? It's God. 
It's the Father. He's the one that rejoices. He's the one that celebrates. And the Bible is telling us that when one person who is far from God, one child of God who comes home to him, that there's unrestrained joy from one end of heaven to the other, that there's this cosmic celebration that happens. And I think that the angels join in and there's this incredible celebration over one person because they matter. Because you matter. And friends, when you start to think about it like that, the love of God, well, it goes from more than just words on a page. I mean, the idea that God loves us, it it can become overwhelming when you think of it in those terms. And it just had to be so clear to these religious leaders now, don't you think, that Jesus wanted them to know that the reason that he's hanging out with these irreligious, questionable character people is because They are valuable to him. And when something valuable is lost, you aggressively search for it. And when it is found, you celebrate and rejoice. And if you want to understand the purpose of this church, we're a pretty simple church. We are a Luke 15 church. And at the heart of who we are is that we want to make sure that no one misses the grace of God. We believe that every single person in this world matters to God, every single one. They are somebody that Jesus died for, every single one. No matter who they are, no matter what they've done, no matter where they've been, and they're very welcome here. They matter to God. They matter. You matter. John 3, 16, the words of Jesus, when he's speaking to Nicodemus, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever, that whoever, that whoever, that whoever, that whoever, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It's for everyone. It is for everyone. It is for everyone. (laughs) Friends, this church is not just about us. There's a church that had a neon sign in front of their church that would flash Jesus only, Jesus only, Jesus only. Not a bad message. And, you know, we're not like a neon sign church, but they had the neon sign, Jesus only. And then a storm came and it knocked out the first three letters of that sign. And then it started flashing us only, us only, us only, us only. Not a good focus for a church. And that's never been the focus of community. Everyone matters. Jesus said, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, come to me, come to me, all, 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 all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. It's for all, it's not just about us. And we want this to be a church that anyone can come to, where anyone can find God, that anyone can find their way back to God. And so we're on this search and rescue mission for people. So what do we do individually as followers of Jesus? We do what he tells us to do. We intentionally build relationships with other people. Why? So we can see to it that no one misses the grace of God. We're intentional about our relational building. And we strive to be just like the apostle Andrew, who was a game changer. Andrew, I mean, I'm used to you know, hearing about Simon Peter. I'm used to hearing about John the Apostle, about James. I mean, the inner circle, the three. But Andrew, yes, Andrew was a game changer because Andrew was the one who met Jesus first. And Andrew is the one who brought his brother, Simon Peter, to Jesus. Read these words with me. I mean, I'll, I'll read them out loud. You just, you're, I'm giving you guys a break today, okay? And so it says, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother, Simon. That was Simon Peter. And tell him, we found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Some of the best words of the Bible, he brought him to Jesus. And if we care about people, we will bring them to Jesus. If we love people, we will bring them to Jesus. The best thing we could possibly do for someone is bring them to Jesus. And Andrew did that. And Andrew was this game changer. Jesus is the hope bringer, the savior of the world. And it never gets old when we bring people to Christ Jesus. God uses us to do this. So I'm going to ask you the question that I ask every, every few months around here. It's an important one. I hope that you can say yes to this question. Will anyone be in heaven because of you? It's Jesus. Yes, I, I understand that. It's Jesus. He's the savior. We're not. But he uses us. And he uses us to bring people to him. So I'm asking you the question, will anyone be in heaven because of you? Friends, I gotta tell you that most of what we're focused on and concerned about right now, it will not matter 
a hundred years from now. It will not matter to us a hundred years from now. A hundred years from now, 500 years from now, it will matter. It will matter the people who we bring to Jesus and we just invite them and we say, come and see. Friends, it's God's call for us as a church to change the world to change the world one person at a time. And changing the world is a team sport, it really is. And that's why at Community, we give you these little invite packs. We gave these to you last week. We do this eh, every couple of months around here. And you pick these up and then you take these with you and you put them in your pocket. I was in a situation this week where I didn't have one. I'm I'm talking about this on Sunday and I don't even have one. And I just tried to tell, I didn't probably should have written it out, but. So now I have them in my wallet. I got a stack of them there. I'd ran out. And so you just have them with you in your wallet and your purse. You have them on you. And I don't know how many people are going to be in heaven one day because of so many of you taking cards like this and just invited a family member or a friend or someone at a restaurant or a shopping, you know, a grocery store, someone that you meet out and about. People will say, some random person just gave me this card. I came. And then I know the rest of their story. They came, they listened, they followed Jesus and they're gonna be in heaven one day. And I gotta tell you, it doesn't get any better than that to know that you're used by God to change another person's eternal destiny, that he uses us to do this. And and you may be thinking, Scott, I I don't really have anybody to ask. I don't know. Okay, well, you start praying a simple prayer. It's the Lord lead me prayer that we pray around here. You just say, Lord, lead me to somebody. Lord, prompt me. Lord, lead me. Lord, prompt me. And you'll go through this pack probably by Tuesday (laughs) because you'll stop and see the people that are already around you, but you'll see with different eyes and a different perspective. And you'll just say, hey, I just want to invite you to the church that I go to. Most people will be very grateful for that. Whether they come or not, they'll be grateful. Most people will. So on your way out today, in all of our lobbies, they're going to be there. They're going to be on tables. They're going to be in different places. You're probably going to have to walk over them. I mean, you're going to have, I mean we're going to make them very convenient so that you don't miss them on your way out today because we want to be in this together. We want to change the world together. So take these cards. Same thing last week I mentioned, and I, you know, if I would have thought ahead, I probably wouldn't have mentioned it last week, but it's two weeks in a row, so you know how important this is. Have a community decal or a community car magnet on the back of your car. People tell me, how'd you find community? Well, I was just driving around. I saw all these magnets or decals on cars. And I decided I went online and I found the church. I started watching it online, watch it for a while. And now I've decided to come in person. Then I know the rest of their story. They come for a little while. They make a faith decision. They're going to be in heaven one day. Why? Because some of us just choose to be this kind of silent witness as we put this on the back of our car, the side of our car, and we drive safely around South Florida, very courteously around South Florida, recognizing the laws and, you know, and and we do that, you know, so anyway, all right, you get the drill there. It can be a positive, it can't be a negative, but anyway, so these are going to be around there and it might be, and the good thing is it's not just a silent witness, this can tee up a conversation. Somebody in your neighborhood's driving by, they see your car in your driveway or they, or they see your car at work and they go, what's that? So it's the church I go to. So yeah, you ought to come. As a matter of fact, I have a, an invitation here. Let me invite you. And they've got great kids programs and great worship. Well, how's, how's the preaching there? How's the speaking there? Well, they've got great kids programs and, they, and they've got great worship. They do. And you say whatever you want about the preaching that way. So, Friends, let's change the world. Let's do this. Let's change the world one person at a time. We can do this. We can. We can do this. We already are doing this. We are. So let's just get in the game. There's nothing greater. There's no greater sense of significance to know that God used you strategically and intentionally and playing this cosmic redemption, this role in helping someone else have the hope of heaven and eternity one day. There's no greater accomplishment that you could ever have on your resume than that. I promise you that will matter to you a hundred years from now. Not much else will. So let's do this. We're just doing what the Bible tells us that Jesus came to do. Luke 19, 10, Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. So we're doing what he calls us to do. And he calls us as his followers to join us in his mission. As a matter of fact, he gives us the co-mission, the great commission. Matthew 28, 19, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the word go actually means as you are going. As you're living your everyday normal life, 
You don't have to go to the other side of the world. Just as you're living your everyday normal life, make disciples, reach people, bring people to Jesus. That's the great commission that he gives to us. We can do this. But you know what the word go also means? It also means go. I mean, it really does mean that some people need to just pick up what they have and to go on the other side of the world. And that's why we love sharing stories of transformation that are happening in West Africa and Asia and in Europe and other parts of the world because of your generosity and the difference that you're making. Some people need to go. And today, I'm asking some of you to go. Serious? I am. I'm asking some of you to go. Not to cross the ocean, but to go to a beach. Pompano Beach. (laughs) That's what I'm asking today. We're about eight weeks out from the relaunch of our Pompano Beach campus. And friends, we have this incredible opportunity to influence and help hundreds and hundreds of people that we're just not able to reach now because it's too far away to help them to be in heaven one day. And we've got a great core team, but we need to build our launch team for when we launch, we're ready to do this. Some of you are wondering, well, Scott, where exactly is the Pompano Beach campus? I get it's in Pompano Beach, but where is it? Well, it's just off of US 1 Federal Highway. It's just one block west of that, and it's just a little bit north of Sample. So it's strategically located. It's in a great position in Pompano Beach. And I know some of you who are already a part of the Pompano Beach launch team, you are so excited about this, and you should be. Pastor G, Gonzalo Venegas, is gonna be our campus pastor. He is our campus pastor. Yeah, let's give it up for G. G is such a great guy, and I'm so thankful that God directed Gonzalo and Amanda to join our team and be a part of the community family and lead out. The worship pastor for our Pompano Beach campus is Jonathan Rosado, who led us in worship today, and Jonathan's going to be leading, and Jonathan does an incredible job, and he's got an amazing heart for God, and it's going to feel like community because it is community. It's going to be community Tamarack, community Pompano Beach. The message every week will be the same. It will be live streamed here, I mean from here, from Tamarack to the Pompano Beach campus, so Whether you're here or there, you're going to hear the same message every single week. And that's why we give that shout out to Pompano Beach, because they're watching this message right now. And they're able to hear this message. So whether you're here or there, it's going to be the same message. Whether it's me or last week, Alex gave an incredible message. And if you didn't hear last week's message, you need to listen to that. So we've got some great teachers that are on our team. The message will be live streamed. We're going to have our grand opening services at Pompano Beach on Easter Sunday this year. So it's going to be April the 9th. We're about two months out, eight weeks out, and we've got this great core, but we need to build our launch team. So I hope that you'll start praying. Some of you that are open, you'll start praying, Lord, lead me. Lord, prompt me. Are you leading me to be a part of the Pompano Beach launch team? Scott, what does it mean to be a part of the launch team? Well, it means that you make a commitment for six months. Six months. You make a commitment for six months to either just worship there like you're doing, but you worship there rather than here. Why? Because we we need to have the critical mass. We need to have the energy that's there when new people are coming, that it feels like this alive and vibrant church. And so we need some people to say, you know what, I'll worship there, you know, for six months. And we need others to say, yeah, I'm not only going to worship there, but I'm going to serve there for six months. And so you make the commitment you're going to serve maybe in guest services or you're a greeter, or you're on the, the parking team, or you work in kids ministry or tech or whatever. We need people to worship. We need people to serve for six months. And, and, and that's what that means. And then at the end of your six month commitment, some of you, you're going to decide, you know what? I made my commitment. I fulfilled it. Now I'm going to come back to the Tamarack campus. And, and this is where you're going to stay. You're going to sense that God's directing you back here. Others will say, you know what? I love being in Tamarack, but I kind of was on the sidelines. But here, I'm in the game. I'm making a difference. I'm serving. I'm going to stay at Pompano. And and God is going to be honored by those who come back and by those who stay. But it's for a six-month commitment. Both are God-honoring. Now, next Sunday at 12.30 p.m., right after our second worship service, Starts at 11.15, goes to 12.15, well, we know 12.20, 1225, but right after around 12.30, upstairs in the loft of this building where we have our starting point lunches, there's going to be a Pompano Beach launch team meeting. 
and Pastor G's gonna be there, and Jonathan's gonna be there, and they're gonna talk about gearing up and planning for and being involved in a part of the launch team. And today, you can make a decision. You don't have to make a commitment today, but today you can make a decision that you're going to attend the launch team meeting next Sunday at 1230. And so there is a QR code that's coming up right now. You can take out your camera. We know through COVID what you need to do. Just take out your camera. You can scan that and then it'll take you to a link in our database and it'll be a form where you just fill out your name and your address and that information and that you're going to attend the lunch. It'll be helpful for us to know that. You can go ahead and say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to make a commitment right here, right now to worship at Pompano for six months starting Easter, or I'm going to make a commitment to serve at Pompano for six months. Or you can say, look, I'm going to commit to being at this lunch and also then to discover more, but I'm not sure about making a commitment yet. And so you just can take out your camera and you can scan that QR code. Or if you want, you can just text the letters PB for Pompano Beach, PB to the number that's on the screen. Same link will pop up on your screen. You can click on that. It'll take you. Uh, and then you can sign up right here, right now. Friends, God wants to use all of us, every single one of us, to change the world. He does. Let's invite. Let's pray. Lord, lead me. Lord, prompt me. He loves to answer that prayer I pray that you'll pray that prayer this week. It's our goal to see to it that no one misses the grace of God, Hebrews 12, 15. So we're on this search and rescue mission for people who are valuable to God. And I just want to say to you today, if you're a spiritually seeking person, I hope that you'll sense how much you matter to God from these three parables that Jesus told, that Jesus told and how much you matter to us as a church God loved you so much that he designed his church that we would be this place where you could find a relationship with him. People walk in here all the time and they say, I, you know, I messed up my life. Can I get a second shot? And through God's grace, the answer is yes. Through Jesus, the answer is absolutely yes. And I, I loved playing football. I played when I was a little kid in elementary school. I played in junior high. I played football in high school. One of my favorite things to do is not just play on a team, but just play in the neighborhood. And when we would play in the neighborhood, usually we would just have two guys on a team. We didn't have a lot of kids in our neighborhood. And, and we'd play on a street, and we would have this, would like, you know, maybe do like a quick, like, fake, you know, pump fake, like a little down and out and the, and the defensive back would kind of bite and come in and then your buddy would go long and you would just wait and you'd come back and you'd just throw the ball and it'd be hanging up in the air and then it would, it hit like a telephone wire and it would go boom. And in our neighborhood, we always said, do over, do over. And what is a do over? It's when you do the play over. It's like, it's like it never happened. It doesn't count against you. It never happened. It's a do over. And there are people who are coming every single week to community who are wondering, is, is there a do-over for me? Yeah, there is. In Jesus, there is. There's his grace, his forgiveness. You think I've done way too much. No, grace is for you. I've, I've walked too far away from God. No, grace is for you. I've been in prison. Grace is for you. I've had an abortion. Grace is for you. I have an addiction, grace is for you. I've been a religious hypocrite, grace is for you. Listen to me, friends, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, grace is for you. Listen to these words about the forgiveness and the love of God from the prophet Isaiah, chapter one, verse 18. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as freshly fallen snow. Even if you were stained as red as crimson, I can make you as white as wool. And Jesus came to save every single one of us and he can make him your savior today. He just, he just asked you to come and you come with a repentant heart and a, and a spirit that wants to change. And the word repentance is a great word. It just means that I, I'm, I'm wanting to change. I'm wanting to change the direction of my life. And you come to him. And if there are a thousand steps between Jesus and you, he'll take 999 of them. But you have to take one. You take one to him. And he can become your savior, your Lord, your hope. He can become the forgiver of your sins and the hope of your future. So today at the end of the service, when we sing our final song after everybody else leaves out, you just come. And you can talk to one of our decision counselors today. Let's, let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you are on this search and rescue mission for every single one of us, that that's the heart of Jesus as he 
stepped out of eternity into time from heaven to this world for the purpose of saving us, for the purpose of seeking after us, for the purpose of calling us to follow him. So Father, I, I, I pray for, for those first who have not yet taken that step that they would just sense how much they matter to you and how much Jesus has done for them and that today would be their day. But Father, for the rest of us as a church, I, 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 I pray that our passion will be inflamed, our passion will, will be relit maybe, that God, that we would live our lives in a way so that we can bring people to Jesus, that we would help him to change this world, to reach one person at a time because every single person matters to you. When we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake today, amen.